Hello, and welcome to part two of my talk on faith, the second of my three-pronged approach to improve our collective awareness and um, uh, reduction of suffering. In part one, we discussed the misogyny pushed by the Abrahamic religions, as well as the religious basis for all wars. In this second part, though, we'll discuss the religious shifts after Christianity and how the old ways managed to survive via the transformation of different religions. We'll finish by extracting the principles of true faith uh, out of this analysis of comparative religion, emphasizing four principles and five essential functions if we're to preserve faith in a way that upholds truth. And by the end of part two, I hope you'll see what humanity needs to do to preserve those essential aspects of religion and of faith itself. I do this work because my work in national security has helped me realize that we've become too numb and accepting of the fact that we're always on the brink of another armed conflict or humanitarian crisis. I've come to see clearly that religion is the inspiration for such bigotry and violence. This is why I firmly believe our path to world peace requires us to stop feeding ourselves false faiths and that feel good and start serving truth. If you've heard other talks by me, you might be familiar with my heal and form progress technique and are already aware that I find it best to start challenging conversations like this off by emphasizing healing. So uh, for some of you who hear this, uh, let's acknowledge that uh, you know, religion is, is a significant part of your suffering. Uh, so may you find greater understanding and healing in this talk. Your awareness about religion is very justified. And the pain that you've experienced in the name of religious views of your family, friends, and others is also very real, and it's undeserved. Conversely, uh, many others who hear this attribute the entirety of their success and survival to their religion, in which case you might find this talk shocking, confusing, and offensive. I understand those reactions are very real for you too. So with this talk, I, I don't mean to deny how religion has helped you in times of adversity nor deny your reason to have faith at all. Uh, quite the opposite, actually. What you are about to hear is actually a defense of faith. I will argue that faith and reason can and should go hand in hand. I merely argue that religion and reason do not. Remembering this will help you with the difficult truths that you're gonna hear in this talk and remind you that the topic is hard, but it's also one that is full of hope. So we resume our analysis of comparative religion with the impact that those voluntarily impoverished Essenes had on other religions. Persecuted, the Essenes infiltrated the lands of the Zoroastrian Persians, where they became known as Elkasites, meaning hidden strength, a nod to the sacred knowledge they continued to perpetuate. The Persians more favorably judged this knowledge than they did of that the, within the Israelites' Torah. The Elkasites taught Zoroastrian rulers that the, uh, the truly transcendent deity that uh, was, was different than the megalomaniac creator that they had been worshiping, and to which they referred to as a demiurge who in error created humankind. Once a people known to make sacrifices for their Ahura Mazda, their leader, they started praying to a deity named Mithra and started viewing all life as sacred though there is evidence they conducted ceremonial bull killing, similar to the Greek cult of Magna Mater and some contemporary Spanish rituals. To the Zoroastrian maxim of good thoughts, good words, good deeds was added another maxim that there is only one path and that is the path of truth. So due to Essene influence, Zoroastrians replaced their book of worship titled 101 Names of Azura Mazda with a manuscript called the Gathas Hymns and referred to their new religion as Mithraism. One concept that was retained in Mithraism was Zoroaster's dark lord, um, known as Angra Mainyu. The closest equivalent to the Elkasites had to this was their judge, uh, the old judge, um, which they called Satan, or uh, who was known as the steward of the gate of life. The Elkasite's message of humankind being judged uh, valuing matrimony 
and abstaining from adultery, living with shame, and eventually dying in the fight for good resonated with these Persian rulers. The Persian commitment to truth and equality was so strong that a line of Persian military leaders known as Mithridates even went to war against the Greco-Romans on behalf of these views and in an attempt to free more Israelites. There was another group fighting the Greco-Romans from the south in a land called Ethiopia, uh, and they must have been part of the inspiration for uh, the book involving uh, Helen of Troy. So in part one, we talked about how scripture and other mythology does provide powerful clues when there is an absence of data usable for science. The, the legendary characters like the couple I just mentioned that you know, we learn about in scripture and mythology likely existed in some form. And through logic and reason, we can make theories about the interrelation of those characters uh, in, in real life and the social circumstances that existed at the time of writing about them. Well, in, in mythology, we see a legend told from both a Greek perspective and an Ethiopian perspective. According to the Greek narrative, the, the rulers of Ethiopia, uh, Cassiopeia and Cepheus, produced a daughter named Andromeda, who takes on a husband, the Greek Perseus the so-called killer of Medusa. But to the Ethiopians, Cepheus is actually Cephalus, husband of Procris, and they had a child named Lucifer, meaning light bringer, who became associated with the morning star, signifying the start of a new day. Lucifer served as a symbol, a messenger even, and possibly even a female one. The Ethiopians associated her with the Roman goddess Venus and the Greek goddess Artemis. In the year 218 CE, Roman Emperor um, Elagabalus conquered the followers of Lucifer and mocked them by creating a religion that also emphasized the sun deity above all others. But that deity, unlike Luciferianism, was uh, a patron of soldiers and the unconquered, and, and it was male. And it was referred to as the Sol Invictus cult. Elagabalus declared that the Sumerians, Jews, and Christians must transfer their most sacred relics to his temple so that it might include the mysteries of every form of worship. Some notable objects um, that came into his possession include the emblem of the Great Mother, the fire of Vesta, the palladium of Athena, the shields of Salai, the beltus of Amasa, um, which is a black conical meteorite with a name meaning house of God. Queen Zenobia uh, from an ornate city of Palmyra, uh, located where the incest, incense route from uh, Arabia met the Silk Road in China, eventually gave way to the siege of Rome and, and the emperor, uh, holding out from 267 to 273 CE, and uh, probably watched as the relics of several shrines devoted to many different gods transferred to the Sol Invictus cult. The following year, Roman Emperor Aurelian made Sol Invictus the official religion and declared December 25th the day of celebration. This was before Christianity, by the way. A few years after that, Emperor Diocletian converted the Sol Invictus pantheon into a temple honoring only himself and famously persecuted both Christians and followers of Sol Invictus. Within the ranks of Diocletian was a future emperor rising uh, by the name of Constantine, who would be the first to endorse Christianity in the year 306 CE, though he did not perpetuate, though he did also perpetuate Sol Invictus in several curious ways. During his reign, much Byzantine art depicts prophets, saints, and angels with a halo that is suggestive of the sun. He also decreed Sunday as the weekly day of rest and his official coinage continues to bear images of Sol until year 326 CE. Additionally, Constantine built the triumphal arc um, that uh, when viewed from the front happens to accentuate the colossal statue of Sol near the Roman Colosseum. So the Christianity endorsed by Constantine was at least some sort of hybrid with the Sol Invictus cult. Rome created a version of the human story in which they adopted the pieces of history of the story that suited them, conveniently leaving out parts about female messiahs, female rulers, and natural lineage. 
Instead of preaching the tale of Solomon, who chose to uphold the equal value of women, we see worship instead of Jesus, who does not even welcome his mother and brother when they wish to talk to him, as told in Mark, Matthew, and Luke. My best guess is the rejection of Solomon relates to Romans' views, uh, viewing Solomon as disobedient, that a mother would act independently from the father, as is uh, related in two Gnostic texts from the Dead Sea Scrolls. One of those, the um, letter from Peter to Philip states, to begin with, concerning the deficiency, referring to, um, I guess, womanhood, um, when the disobedience and the foolishness of the mother, who without the command of the majesty of the father, she wanted to set up eternal realms. When she spoke, the arrogant one, referring to the son, followed. He assigned the powers within his authority to mold mortal bodies, and they came into being from a misrepresentation of the appearance. So this suggests, this passage suggests that the this, this son in, question, in discussion was encouraging consorting with people who the author of the passage, um, clearly somebody of power, deemed to be of inferior appearance. Later, the Gnostic texts provide an excerpt from this father, suggesting that the son had returned to him and was granted fullness. Uh, I spoke with the one who is mine, and the one who is mine listened to me just as you also have listened to me today. And I gave him authority to enter into the inheritance of his father. And I took him filled through his salvation. Since he was deficiency, he became fullness. So this account considers, it sounds similar to the Christian parable of the prodigal son as told by Jesus. Uh, many consider it a reference to biblical Jacob. However, it also resembles the legend of Solomon. The controversy about Solomon may be for this reason that the word prodigal used in um, first used in the 15th century means wasteful, even though its Latin root, prodigium, which uh, happens to be the same root as the word prodigy, actually means a wonder, an omen, or a prophetic sign. So thusly does the legend of Jesus seem to be, you know, blended, uh, a, bl a blending of the life of Solomon as well as the Sol Invictus cult. Uh, like the prodigal son, there was a war over the proper descendants of David after Solomon, uh, whether Rehoboam or Jeroboam. Uh, according to the kingdom of Israel, the line went David, Solomon, Jeroboam, and on, uh, with several transfers of power that did not involve a transfer from father to son. Matthew actually follows a line through um, the Judeans with David, the Solomon, Rehoboam, 12 names, and then Sheltil, Zerubbabel, nine names, and then Joseph and Jesus. Luke, on the other hand, follows the line of Nathan, one of the elder brothers of Solomon, claiming the line went David, Nathan, 19 names, then Sheltil, um, Zerubbabel, 18 names, Joseph, and then Jesus. So there's not even consistent, the, the, the gospels are not even consistent on the number of generations between them. Meanwhile, the oral tradition of the Essenes have the, the line going through women, not even men. But today, in a world that values democracy, such bloodlines are an example of bigotry. So the accuracy is not as important as the evidence of the sexism ordained by Christians and Jews alike. So these gospels that you know, don't even agree with one another also suggest that Jesus refers to those going off to war uh, for Rome as possessed swine, uh, found in both Matthew and Luke. But to others, Pesbazas Swan might instead be a reference to the people deemed dirty, possibly the people of Sodom and Gomorrah, as uh, Matthew and Luke continue the resentment expressed about those cities in Genesis and other books in the, in the Bible. Um, so perhaps it was meant to allude to both, uh, some sort of double bigotry. The troubles with the Gospels continued, despite the church's efforts at harmonization in those years leading up to Constantine's rule. The disjointed flow of the Gospels as they skip from tale to tale with different rhetorical styles are all signs that excerpts were added by multiple authors at different points in time. One known harmonizer was uh, Tatian, a uh, student of Justin Martyr, actually, both writing about 100 years after the life of Jesus. In this harmonization, elements were sorted and numbered with portions even excluded and perhaps new ones included. Those who study such things suggest the lost scripture uh, called Q source as one of the origins of, 
of these uh, of the New Testament. And it, it uh, is thought to include many parables about do's and do nots. Uh, it's where, for instance, we find the love thy neighbor guidelines. With, the, with this Q source content uh, came more sexism, like the head of every woman is man, Corinthians 11, uh, 11 3. The husband is the head of the wife, Ephesians 5, 23. And in this way, they can train the young women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure managers of their household, kind and subject to their own husbands so that the word of God will not be discredited in Titus 2, 4. The same sexism made its way into new chapters we now call the Gospels, which relayed four partially corroborating accounts of this male savior miraculously healing pain, possession, paralysis, seizure, and blindness, though many of these miracles could be interpreted as figurative more than literal. According to Matthew, uh, Jesus uh, comforted others. Blessed are the persecuted because theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Yet one of the more unsettling aspects of these tales is how Jesus only heals those who believe in him. Matthew 8.13, Matthew 9.29, Mark 5.36, Mark 9.23, Luke 7.9, Luke 8.50, and John 12.40. And how so many people seem to not realize how immoral that thinking is. As a, as a former paramedic, I never could have looked down on an invalid and asked, do you want to get well? As was um, recorded in John 5.6, or even suggested that someone who was sick was not valid. The Gospels at times, so therefore, provide, um, or not therefore, uh, the Gospels at times provide conflicting accounts of the life of Jesus as well. One of the unique aspects of the Gospel of Matthew is it mentions an earthquake at the, at the moment of uh, the death of Jesus, which is a pretty significant event that should have been mentioned in the other Gospels, uh, that, which, you know, claim to be witness to the goings on of Jesus. So a, a glaring difference in the Gospel of Luke is... Uh, Jesus' prophecy for Jerusalem, even though the introduction um, of, of the Gospel of Luke uh, by Theosophus uh, makes it clear that that Gospel was recorded far later and uh, with the perfect vision of hindsight. The Gospel of Luke happens to be the only one to give an account of Elizabeth, a descendant of Aaron, and her miraculous old age birth of John the Baptist. And Luke is also the only gospel that has Jesus addressing the daughters of Jerusalem with, do not weep for me, but for yourself, Luke 23, 28. Uh, a uniqueness in the gospel of Mark is that it provides the most detailed version of John the Baptist being executed due to the wishes of Herod's dancing daughter. It also refers to Herod, Herod as a king and not a tetrarch. So the author of um, Mark's gospel seems to be sympathetic to Herod. While the short version of the Gospel of Mark is dated to year 305, there is a long ending that has dated back to the second century and includes references of speaking in new tongues, taking up snakes, and drinking poison without being harmed. So these pertinent redactions from the Gospel of Mark appear to be how the church responded to criticism by the skeptic Porphyry. The Gospel of John is different from other Gospels in other ways. Uh, aside from leaning hard towards what's considered the Coptic religion of North Africa, uh, in John we find references to the apostles as fishers of men, reflecting the very intentional efforts by the apostles to reach the masses with the message of Jesus. The Gospel of John, above all, though, brings light to the role of women to Jesus and his followers. While other Gospels seem to minimize the existence of Mary at all, John exclaims that there were actually three Marys, uh, Mary Magdalene, Mary, a handmaid and mother of Jesus, and something about a Mary of Cleopas, uh, a name which means father loving. The Gospel of Philip, not in the church's canon, but in the Najamadi library, echoes this, and it also refers to Mary Magdalene as the uh, kononos, or companion of Jesus. Such a claim would mean Jesus in life was actually not celibate, um, as was practiced by later by priests, and, and also practiced in, at that time by the Essenes who influenced the teaching of Jesus. The Gospel of John explains more, though, about uh, the early church views of women, saying that the apostle and eventual first pope, Peter, was angry that Jesus confided his teachings to a woman. Peter says, did he really speak with a woman in private without our knowledge? Should we all listen to her? 
did he prefer her to us? To which the apostle Levi rebukes Peter saying, Peter, you're always angry. Now I see you are arguing against this woman like an adversary. If the savior made her worthy, who are you to reject her? Peter, who became the first Pope, along with many early church fathers dismissed the role of Mary. And she soon became known as a hysterical female as recorded by the pagan Celsus. Additional light is shown of John's view of women in relation to the temple of Artemis, protected by the uh, Ephesians. Acts 19.35 suggests the people worshiping at the temple rioted against John, yet were calmed by the priest of the temple. Later in the Acts of John, chapters 37 to 47, uh, contained within the New Testament uh, Apocrypha of the same time period, described John praying at the altar of Artemis which would explain his association in art with the serpent cult. It would also explain the church, why the church considers all the apostles as martyrs with the exception of John. So despite the major glorification of the father and not the mother throughout the gospels, John appears to present Mary Magdalene subtly as uh, the first apostle, while the others did not truly honor women as equals, nor humans worthy of worship as deities. And, uh, and, and see their role merely as companions, mistresses, and mothers. The Gospel of John, though, provides testimony that the original Jesus may have been teaching the equal rights of women. Unfortunately, the Gospels were so overcome by events, and uh, that event being the appointment of Emperor Nero, who beheaded the Apostle John, crucified the first Pope Peter, and since then, Christianity has been turned even further toward male monotheism for the betterment of all those males in power. Some wishful thinkers like to believe that multiple accounts of the four gospels and the 12 apostles are collaborating evidence of the crucifixion and resurrection. Yet I say that the church actually did us a huge favor by giving us four conflicting accounts with the four gospels. More than anything, the differences prove that the book cannot all be the words of the all-knowing supreme being. And for that simple reason that not every passage can actually be true. If one piece is not true, then it should cause us to question every piece of it. Almost in response, Jesus, according to Matthew, advises his subjects not to cut off a toe that causes you to stumble, thereby asking them to simply overlook errors in the, in the teachings. Uh, just as he, he warns, do not put your, the Lord your God to the test, Matthew 4, 7. It should cause pause, though, that at a time when paper was so easily available, Jesus himself did not write anything down. And all we have are these secondhand accounts that conflict and only parallel because of the harmonizing that occurred three centuries later. As if um, the miracles of Jesus are not hard enough to believe, the, the church would have us believe that Jesus instructed the healed blind men, see that no one knows about this, Matthew 9.30, and ordered the healed leopard to tell no one, Mark 1.40. Similarly, Mark in 8.30 has Jesus giving strict orders not to tell others that he was the son of God, yet refers to himself as the son of God in other three gospels and in the same exact gospel, Mark 1.11, Mark 5.7, Mark 9.7, and Mark 14.61. John takes it a step further, explaining first thing that Jesus is the word and the word is God and therefore Jesus is God and not just the son of God, John 1.1. 1, 1. However, this seminal word concept was not even argued until Justin Martyr, a hundred years after Jesus existed. More suspicious scripture are those that portray the centurions favorably, suggesting that they offer Jesus a wet sponge, Matthew, 5, uh, Matthew 8, 5, which is perhaps laughable considering how we know exactly how merciful law enforcers tend to be. Even more unbelievable are the accounts that make us believe one centurion, Pontius Pilate, was somehow a conspirator in saving Jesus when, a hundred years after the crucifixion, the Jews were still at war with Rome. The crucifixion occurred almost 300 years before Rome even decided to become Christian. Before that, in fact, just 30 years before that, Christians were still being put to death. So these kinds of incompatibilities with the known record are a reminder that just because some of the passages preach goodness does not make them all good. But because some passages are wrong, it does mean that we cannot consider the work as a whole um, to be considered holy. The Gospels are probably written at different times, evidenced by the escalation in language from version to version. Matthew 10.40 uh, has the concept of listening to one group, 
in Luke 10, 16, becoming the assertion of the rejection of a different group, which in John 15, 23, becomes a hatred of that group. So another theory is that the four gospels represented four separate versions tailored different points in time, specifically for each of the four tetrarchs, with each set customized to appeal to the people of respective parts of that world. Matthew the Apostle, for instance, is entombed in Salerno, Italy, in the region of the Greco-Roman Tetrarch. Mark the Evangelist died in Alexandria, within the Tetrarch of North Africa. Luke the Evangelist died in Greece, in what at that time was the Tetrarch of Mesopotamia. And John the Evangelist died in modern-day Turkey, which was the Tetrarch of Byzantium. The Gospels are also thought to correspond to the four horsemen of the coming apocalypse, the word apocalypse meaning lifting of the veil, suggesting a sharing of knowledge that was to come and um, nothing actually related to mass extinction or reckoning. The four horsemen are not to be confused with the four beasts of the book of Revelation, lion, ox, man, and eagle, uh, which was written by somebody else named John, and yo, though often they are. The entire farce though, of the Christian church has created this demand for replicas of these false relics. And people in their lust for money would sell items for worshiping Jesus. And, and what sold most was an image of Jesus similar to that of uh, Cesar Borgia, uh, who was actually the illegitimate son of a supposedly celibate Pope. And for this delusion, we, ha we have these um, talented Renaissance artists to thank. Thank you, uh, you know, those with the Ninja Turtle names. Um, who have solidified this idea of this image of Jesus in our minds, a false image, by the way, that causes our subconscious to prefer pinkness. I want to be very clear to everyone who reads this, that it's no trivial matter that the human form of the leader of the Christian religious movement has over time been corrupted from one of much melanin, melanin to one that is far paler. Because in doing so, it's stripped, the, you know, the more melanin among us, the, you know, stripped black people, of yet another hero reminding them of their power and their worth. Especially given that after murdering, raping, and slaving millions of blacks, pink faces have brutally converted blacks into Christians, telling them God was pink and that if they ever wanted to meet him, they had to forgive pink people and everything pink people did to them and their ancestors. And it worked. So many millions of, um, of uh, our black uh, peers fight to defend this religion even now almost 2000 years later. I think what I find most baffling about racism and religion is that racists can condemn God's creatures and savagely call them um, savages because they believe that God is on their side. Yet they deny they're doing it, suggesting that they just don't like lazy people or loud people or nonconformists or non-family or anyone who just doesn't bow to authority. Well, as a paramedic, I saw humans in sad situations where they lost their humanity, but I have never seen such savage souls and such denial of it like white supremacists are. False religion is the only explanation I have for such moral failure. I find it no exaggeration to say that the Catholic Church has only ever paid lip service to helping Blacks and has barely budged on gender equality and other gender equality. This is the Vatican who helped the Italian fascist regime escape during World War II and the Vatican who hung God's banker from the Blackfriars Bridge in 1982. It's also the Vatican that controls its own country so that it can forgive itself for its own crimes. Yet a majority of us still grant it the authority to define right from wrong. Those falsifiers of Jesus happen to retain in their edicts of, of what is right and wrong, uh, the concept of the devil that was prominent in Zoroastrianism. Yet they give him a name uh, that the Israelites kept for thousands of years, uh, Satan. This new Christian church capitalized on the mortal fear of death and aging, uh, telling followers that eternal life would come to those who practice prescribed rituals. See Acts 24, 15, Romans 2, 7, Romans 5, 21, Romans 6, 23, Revelation 20, 12. Revelation 21, 4, Psalms 22, 26, Corinthians 15, 51, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Galatians 6, 8, Thalassonians 4, 17, Timothy 1, 14, Timothy 6, 12, Titus 3, 7, and Luke 18, 27. Then the evangelist John, who whoever wrote the gospel of John, cranked it up even more with 
John 1, 2, John 2, 17, John 2, 24, John 3, 16, John 3, 36, John 4, 14, John 5, 11, John 5, 20, John 5, 24, John 5, 28, John 6, 27, John 6, 40, John 10, 27, and John 11, 25, John 12, 25, and John 17, 2. Whew. So while John was all about converting convincing converts, the original concept of eternal life likely came about from cowardly people in power, trying to convince impressionable people to fight their battles for them. For a religion that has created and perpetuated so many lies, the Christian church is awfully brazen to teach sin and morality, but that's what churches do. From the so-called desert fathers, we get the seven cardinal sins, pride, greed, lust, envy, gluttony, wrath, and sloth. Virtues that allow the rich to keep the poor subdued and don't seem to apply equally to the rich and powerful in our society. There is one sin in particular that our U.S. society and other parts of the world has completely lost, and that is pride. We've written it off as false based on the idea that pride is good and we should revel in our achievements or those of close associates, and that's partly true. Where pride becomes problematic is where we attribute a betterness based on those traits, possessions, and achievements, and shame those who have less. All of us have witnessed in ordinary daily activities the demonic ugliness of judgment of other humans deemed less worthy. Yet rarely do we see our peers speaking up to condemn such statements and actions, or do so ourselves. Because too few of us are capable of recognizing pride, I find it essential that in naming the cardinal sins, we, we replace the term pride, very seriously acknowledge the widespread presence of a, of a different sin called bigotry, and then commit to speaking up and, do, and, um, and pointing it out when we see it. So in the third century, it was Diocletian who was violently persecuting, Christian, persecuting Christians, but in the sixth century, it was Roman Emperor Justinian um, who, was, who was persecuting non-Christians, especially Jews, uh, restricting their civil rights and interfering with the affairs of their synagogues. Justinian is considered a nursing father, almost at the level of a church father, for his numerous religious enactments, which contain statues that decree the total destruction of paganism in private life. The church enforced these provisions vigorously and participating, uh, particularly targeting, targeting Asia Minor and Africa, even against several high ranking officials. Justinian held leverage over Rome and felt entitled to settle disputes in papal elections, such uh, as occurred when he appointed um, Vigilius as Pope in 537 CE and banished uh, his rival to a remote island where he died of famine a few months later. Joining the um, Jews and pagans in resistance was the Samaritans who were polytheists who conducted repeated insurrections against the orthodoxy of Justinian. So enter Muhammad who in his life from 570 to 632 CE was a political, social, and religious leader who championed monotheism among the polytheists in the city of Mecca, and who later became known as the final prophet, according to the Muslims. Uh, in pre-Islamic Arabia, the gods and goddesses were viewed as protectors, and the Kaaba shrine at the town of Mecca was the site of an annual pilgrimage to pay homage to some 360 deities. The conflict over religion in the area of Mecca at this time was so bad that governors instituted sacred months during which all violence was forbidden, making it possible to participate in the pilgrimages and fairs without danger. In 530, I'm sorry, in 595 CE, a 25-year-old Muhammad married a wealthy 40-year-old widow and was suspiciously selected by chance to lay the eastmost black stone in the Kaaba after it had been renewed for renovation. In 629 CE, after uh, eight years of intermittent fighting with Meccan tribes, the nearly 60-year-old Muhammad gathered an army of 10,000 Muslim converts and conquered Mecca. A significant and ironic factor in the success of Muhammad was his ability to attract the masses by exclaiming that the Quran requires payment of an alms tax for the benefits of the poor. Nonetheless, Muhammad was not a peacemaker, but an instigator of religious conflict and war. Followers of Muhammad today claim that by being in the prophetic line, he 
would um, be a supporter of Jesus, yet Muhammad seems to have overlooked Exodus 22, 21, in which the prophet says, you shall not wrong a stranger or oppress him, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. So afterwards referred to as a light giver, Muhammad produced a, a religious book uh, in the Quran, which was reportedly uh, revelations that he received from God directly and is regarded by Muslims as uh, the word of God verbatim. The Quran commands Muhammad to proclaim and praise the name of his Lord and instructs him not to worship idols or associate other deities with God, like the Romani and other Shaktis were doing at the time. I read the Quran for the first time at age 14, and I remember thinking it was not very original. Uh, it very much follows the Hebrew Bible so closely. Uh, it, it appears almost as a translation customized to sell male monotheism to Arabian audiences. Anyway, the expectations for believers at this time were few in number. Just believe in God, ask for forgiveness of sins, offer frequent prayers, assist those in need, reject cheating and greed, and be chaste and do not commit female infanticide. This latter one was apparently a significant issue at the time. But on top of the Quran, uh, Muhammad urged his followers to take what he did and form a body of literature that discussed the prescribed uh, traditional customs and practices in the Islamic community, both social and legal, excuse me. <clears throat> the result was the Sunnah sayings and suggestions of Muhammad. However, like the uh, Christian gospels, there are several competing collections of these Sunnah Hadiths worshiped by different denominations of Islam. Some Muslims uh, even place Hadiths above the Quran, which is seen as not necessarily consistent with the verbal teachings. Shia Muslims, give preference to Hadis credited to the prophet's family and close associates, while Sunni Muslims do not consider family lineage in evaluating Hadis narrated by any of the thousands of companions of Muhammad. Muslim historians say that the Caliph Uthman ibn Affan, the third successor of Muhammad, was once his secretary and urged Muslims to record the Hadis, just as Muhammad suggested to some of his followers to write down his words and actions. Uh, his efforts to do so, however, were interrupted by his assassination, and no sources survived directly from this period, as they were not collected, compiled, and collated until a generation later. Both Shiites and Sunnis, though, uh, in, their, in their epic battle for the true line of succession for Muhammad, are wrong in, by today's standards for not only um, worshiping the father and not the mother, but also for insisting on a transfer of power via lineage. Um, it's noteworthy, though, that Shiites claim the successor to uh, Muhammad to be his daughter, Fatima, even if it's because she was the only descendant out of six to live to adulthood. Guardianship of the Kaaba went to his tribe, though, the Quraysh, uh, a name that evokes Cyrus, actually, the Persian king famous for expanding his empire uh, through conquest, and also for reportedly freeing the Hebrews uh, from their reported captivity. He then began to dispatch expeditions aimed at eliminating symbols and evidence of pre-Islamic religion. It's reported that he personally took his sword to the statue of the goddess Aluza, after which time she became depicted as a black Ab Abyssinian uh, woman, naked with disheveled hair. The Book of Idols, written around 800 CE about pre-Islamic Arabia, quotes the prophet Muhammad as saying, that was Aluza, but she is no more, the Arab Shahabnam after her. The book was described, also described the concept of a shirk, uh, Arabian term for the sin of polytheism. So what we see with um, Islam is we see conversion from polytheism to uh, male monotheism. In the Western world, Islam is often condemned because of a barbaric principle of Islamic orthodoxy called Sharia law. It's essential for global harmony that today's adherents of Sharia law become informed of the dubious basis of its beliefs that they hold so ardently. However, it's unreasonable to, you know, for the rest of us to expect such a transformation from um, so many others when we as a people are predominantly composed of a religion in Christianity that has a legacy even more violent and more persistently in air. Perhaps in defiance of Christianity, Muslims generally avoid depictions of Muhammad and decorate mosques with inscriptions and calligraphy rather than sculptures or other images of the prophet. And uh, this is to ensure worship of God, not any prophet. Still, unlike Christianity, 
Still, I'm inclined to wonder whether Muhammad as a prophet was premeditated public relations campaign devised to convert Arabians to monotheism in ways that would best align with their customs. It's you know, a theory, but um, if I were to guess at the origin of such a conspirator, I'd lean towards John the Faster, uh, ecumenical patriarch of Constantinople, who is reported to have died in 595 CE, the same year Muhammad wed the wealthy widow. The canons of John the Faster are also interesting because they, they reveal that sodomy at the time was not thought of in same-sex terms, but in terms of um, the act of anal intercourse. Sodomy being between husband and wife was actually penanced more severely than sodomy between unmarried males, which reflects that that same sex aspect of homosexual sodomy was mitigating rather than aggravating. Interesting view on homosexuality. Muhammad is just another of many examples in the chronicle of the damage done in our world time and time again by a bigoted male ego. The fact that we read about Prophets, kings, and emperors does not mean that these individuals were glorious. Zoroaster, Moses, Mani, Muhammad were male gods with God complexes, or males with God complexes, promoters of war and death for the sake of their own power. So basically the opposite of what we should want to be as a person. The same was true of the so-called greats, Cyrus, Alexander, Constantine, and Justin Tinian. Uh, I'm sorry, Justinian, who were merely conquerors representing the opposite of freedom. Uh, in 1054, the Great Schism, uh, Schism, I don't know how to say that word, occurred, um, splitting the Eastern and Western factions of the church due to controversy over the role of the emperor in the rule of the church. Previously, the church had agreed on five regional patriarchs at the Council of uh, Chalcedon in year 540, I'm sorry, 451. However, at the Council of Trullo in year 692, the patriarchs agreed to reject many of the new emperor-influenced customs as non-Orthodox, like fasting on Saturdays, depicting Christ as a lamb, and using unleavened bread in the sacrament. These all, uh, they also rejected celibacy and upheld the right of married men to become priests, though still forbidding priests to marry and forbidding bishops to live with their wives. To combat the unorthodox influence of the emperor in church affairs, the church attempted to institute primacy over the emperor and a, a concept called papal infallibility. In defiance of being accused of being an Orthodox, the emperor led church became known as the Eastern Orthodox church based out of Constantinople, distinct from the Catholic church based in Rome. Not long after the Catholic church would initiate crusades against the East to claim possession of key religious relics. In the 12th century, Pope Innocent III greatly expanded the scope of those crusades uh, into Israel, Spain, and southern France, where an anti-clerical group called the Cathars was based. The Cathars were, uh, they professed that God had a female equivalent, Sophia, representing wisdom. <clears throat> With women among the ranks, the Cathars lived without possessions and performed manual labor to get by, which appealed to many at the time disillusioned with the opulence of the church. To counter the impact of the Cathars, Pope Innocent III in 1209 CE established the Franciscan Order, a clan of simple living purists led by Francis of Assisi who professed the purity of the savior Jesus. A few decades later in 1233, Pope Gregory IX, cousin of Pope Innocent III, instituted the Papal Inquisition, whereby the Franciscan Order were utilized to conduct trials against heretics of the church which involved confiscation of property, imprisonment, torture, and sometimes, um, if not repentant, even death by burning at the stake. Around this time, a group known as the Knights Templar, who were among the most skilled fighters during the Crusades, started to take bribes and become cooperative with local officials along their network of Templar houses across Europe and the Near East. The Knights Templar were, were dissolved eventually by Pope Clement in 1305 and uh, in 1307, were suddenly charged with heresy, arrested, tortured, and burned at the stake by King Philip IV of France. From this, Freemasonry began to emerge, attracting candidates who profess faith only in a non-specified supreme being. So don't think for a minute that the royal families were not involved um, because they were absolutely, and, and even today are knowing and participating in this religious schism. 
to, the, to this day, Royals are quite aware, um, uh, even more so than what I'm speaking of. And, and yet they do not reveal this truth to us. They are the ones in power who stand to lose from instability. So they pretend to be faithful to a Christian God or a Jewish God or a Muslim God in order to promote calm and feign peace, all the while justifying their wars. Let them eat cake, they say, regarding whether to unveil this information to us or to keep us blissfully ignorant. In 1517, uh, an ordained priest by the name of Martin Luther disputed the church's stance of indulgences and also argued that salvation is not earned by good deeds, but by the grace bestowed for faith in the Redeemer. Jesus. He published his teachings in a series of pamphlets in the German language and ultimately created his own version of the Christian Bible. After studying the works of Martin Luther, an English scholar by the name of Tyndale created an English translation uh, of this New Testament in 1538 against the wishes of the church. When the church met in 1545 at the Council of Trent, one topic discussed was the development of of a list of prohibited books. Uh, these banned books included works of science like Kepler's Epitome Astronomae, uh, Kant's Critique of Pure Reason, and Tyndale's Protestant Bible. Instead, King James of England prepared his own English translation of the Bible, and it was available by 1611. King James's version, among other changes, added a, you know, made changes to the commandments um, emerging merging two in order to keep the number at 10. His English translation also gives us the phrase fire and brimstone uh, as an expression of judgment, God's wrath and eternal damnation. It incited, incited charged discussion and even accusations from both sides that the other denies the one true God, easily overlooking that they all seem to have made a giant leap in worshiping a male single God to begin with. And this is what was going on at the time of the Age of Enlightenment, when the works of scientists and philosophers were becoming circulated through academies, Masonic lodges, literary salons, and coffee houses. This is really not far from where we are today, with people choosing to chew on a plethora of information available, or choosing not to at all. Luther, in his pamphlets, propagated some pretty atrocious ideas about deniers of Christ, especially Jews. Through Luther, we see the accusations that drive resentment against Jews that continue to this day. He writes how Jews refer to Christ as nebulous, not real, like their gods Yahweh and Baal. He relates that Jews refer to the Virgin Mary as a harlot and her son a bastard. He also condemns Jews for avarice and use of usury to swindle others, particularly Christians. In 1537, he wrote in on the Jews and their lives, which called for burning synagogues and schools and property confiscation and no mercy nor legal protection for Jews. Defenders of Luther point out that he had no issue with Jews who practiced Christianity, so he was just anti-Judaic rather than anti-Semitic. Still, Luther alludes to Jewish elitism, giving how Judaism does exalt Jews, um, while distinguishing non-Jews as heathen goyim. Such elitism seems to come at least in part from Jewish claims of superior bloodlines. They claim goes back to Adam and Eve. Bloodlines, after all, are nothing but a form of bigotry. Jews in their, belief pretend, in their beliefs pretend to know something Christians don't, something that seems to relate to ancestry, specifically African ancestry. Adolf Hitler, uh, a notorious critic of Jews who preferred a so-called white race over others, referred to Jews and Negroes as if almost interchangeable. Shlomo Sand's book, Invention of the Jewish People, explains that white Jews were Khazarians of Scythian ancestry who rejected both Christianity and Islam during the Dark Ages. Uh, these Scythians were known to be female freedom fighters. So it appears that after the corruption of Christianity and development of Islam, that those fighting against male monotheism took to corrupting an already corrupted Judaism as a method to defeat Christian deceptions. In 1453 CE, Constantinople, Constantinople fell to the Muslim Ottomans who instituted a multinational multilingual empire among the Eastern and Western world for six centuries. In the 16th century, an Ottoman Sultan Suleiman was a namesake of biblical Solomon 
uh, is regard, who is regarded as a saint in Eastern Orthodox and also by Muslims. Um, perhaps more like Solomon's father David, though, Solomon personally led Ottoman armies in conquering the Christian strongholds. Though a conqueror, Suleiman gave particular attention to the plight of the, the Reyes, the Christian subjects uh, who worked his land, worked the lands of the uh, Ottomans. His reforms governing uh, levies and taxes raised the status of Reyes above the serfdom uh, enough that Christian serfs are said to have migrated to Ottoman territories for a better life. The Sultan also played a role in protecting Jewish subjects of his empire like when they were accused of murdering Christian children for blood rituals. Suleiman also enacted new criminal legislation that reduced the instances requiring death or mutilation as punishment. In the 18th century, the Ottoman military system eventually started to fall behind that of their rivals, uh, namely the Russian Empire. And by the end of World War I, Ottoman influence in the world was tremendously reduced to the boundaries of modern day Turkey, uh, a mostly Sunni state. During that world war, the Ottomans conducted a genocide of 1.5 million Armenians, 150,000 Assyrians, uh, 450,000 Pontic Greeks, at which time the entire Christian population of the empire had been killed or fled or was hiding by the end of the war. And inspired, Russia carried out the Red Terror and two decades later, the Great Purge, executing at least 780,000 Russians. And this was answered by, uh, the German ethnic cleansing, uh, General Planost um, of Russians in 1941 to 45, which resulted in over 3 million Russian deaths in the next world war. And this is the same Germany, a predominantly Protestant regime, I might add, that was responsible for 6 million deaths as part of the Holocaust genocide of European Jews. So um, yeah, uh, an ugly human record um, that, you know, that we we have uh, have a story of, and you know this this type of religious timeline. You know, we keep need to keep in mind that the stories tend to be written by the victors, and the ideas that carried on, especially in early history, were those that the rich and powerful wanted to be spread. So for a very long time, the the major power has been the Catholic Church. The printing press changed the game a bit and allowed Protestantism, but. Uh, to flourish, but <clears throat> it, you know, it made it more affordable to spread ideas, including those that um, protested the church. So it's no coincidence that the rise of Protestantism occurred not long after the Crusades when the church employed warriors to travel far and wide and try to destroy records of competing ideas while using a you know, pleasant sounding cover story to being on a mission in pursuit of a container of relic, uh, of some relic. Uh, the crusade to conceal records that would debunk the Abrahamic religions has continued from the Great Schism uh, all the way up to the current world wars. Among other power exchanges, the world wars resulted in the approval by the United Nations of a new nation of Israel, which has had the added benefit of being in a position of military influence over Muslim nations in the region and therefore since has been continuously engaged in military conflicts with countries of both Sunni and Shia Muslims. The participants in those world wars, instead of warring outright, carefully conceal their religious intentions through more recent proxy wars. The countries with which the US has fought its two longest wars, Afghanistan and Iraq, both had Russian affiliations, making those wars a power grab by a Christian US against a secular Russia. These wars also served as a front for the coordinated destruction of religious landmarks, relics, and culture in cities like Barrakash and Palmyra. So it's now more evident that the U.S. has been encroaching on the autonomy and natural resources of Muslim nations as proxies against direct conflicts with Russia. We are complicit in the deaths of so many Muslims and by our hypocrisy have made ourselves targets of reciprocal uh, karma. Other actions have already come back to bite us, like when we worried of a Russian takeover of Iran and in 1953 led a coup d'etat against the Iranian Prime Minister Mosaddegh, which ultimately led in the Iranian Revolution of 1979 and the subsequent US hostage crisis. Uh, Iran afterward becoming less democratic instead of more and actually more intolerant of the hypocrisy of 
Western claims of religion, religious freedom and free speech. So don't think that this kind of thing hasn't been happening since the world wars. Um, the Bosnian war even saw a breakup of Eastern Orthodox Serbs and Catholic, Catholic Croats from a predominantly Muslim Yugoslavia and saw all three sides supported by foreign fighters of similar ideological uh, religious ideologies from different countries. And then it saw the genocide of 7,000 Muslims in the territory of the Eastern Orthodox Serbs. Fearing these families would join the fight against their new rival territories, the Serbs executed the very people that they had been living next to. While most conflicts over the religious timeline were more obviously over racism and sexism, uh, this is less apparent with the rift between Germany and Russia. It's questionable whether the issue was Christian versus secular, due in large part to the mixed messaging of Adolf Hitler when it comes to religion. On one hand, Hitler was a Christian and an and, and anti-Semite. He's quoted as saying, Jesus made no secret of his attitude toward the Jewish people. And when necessary, he even took a whip <clears throat> to drive from the temple the Lord, uh, his adversary of all humanity who then as always saw in religion nothing but an instrument for his business existence. In return, Christ was nailed to the cross. See, uh, the deicide by the, by the Jews clearly contributed to the anti-Semitism of Hitler, who saw Jesus as a fighter, not against the Romans, but against capitalist Jews. He gave himself, said Hitler, to liberate his country from Jewish depression. He set himself against Jewish capitalism, and that's why the Jews liquidated him. It would seem Hitler sympathized with uh, with that, because he himself felt his country of Germany was under the oppression of Jewish capitalism. Adolf Hitler was influenced by Martin Luther, but also by German philosopher Karl Marx, who said, what is the worldly religion of the Jew? Huckstering. What is his worldly God? Money. Money is the jealous God of Israel, in face of which no other God may exist. Money degrades all the gods of man and turns them into commodities. The bill of exchange is the real God of the Jew. His God is only a illusory bill of exchange. The chimerical nationality of the Jew is a nationality of the merchant and the man and money in general. The Jew has emancipated himself in a Jewish manner, not only because he has acquired financial power, but also because through him and also apart from him, money has become a world power and the practical Jewish spirit has become the practical, practical spirit of the Christian nations. So Hitler believed that Jesus' true teachings had been corrupted by the apostle Paul, uh, who had transformed them. And in case you haven't noticed, Hitler's views are similar to the case that I make in this talk in that regard. So uh, please allow me to clarify that the secular movement for which I strive uh, must certainly condemn the authoritarianism and violence of both communist Russia and anti-communist Hitler. Hitler uh, also expressed disapproval of Christianity, mostly that it was not aggressive enough. Uh, sometimes he spoke well even of Islam, suggesting that if Germany followed Mohammedan, uh, Mohammedanism, <laughs> uh, a cult which glorifies heroism and which opens the seventh heaven to the bold warrior alone, then the Germanic races would have conquered the world. In another quote, he said, you see, it's been our misfortune to have the wrong religion. Why didn't we have the religion of the Japanese who regard sacrifice for the fatherland as the highest good? The Islam too would have been much more compatible to us than Christianity. Why did it have to be Christianity with its meekness and flabbiness? The church's response to Hitler was indeed flabby. Uh, according to historian Robert P. Erickson, who wrote, as Hitler's genocidal plans began to manifest, Catholic priests and bishops held no public protests. Instead, they prayed in support of Germany's cause, seeking to show that their support for Hitler was undiminished. However, in uh, 1937, uh, Pope Pius XI did defiantly denounce German violations and the pagan myth of blood and soil, which uh, with his speech uh, with burning concern, he wrote, Whoever exalts race or the people or the state above their standard value and devonizes them to an idolatrous level. Uh, surprisingly, this Pope added, you know, none but superficial minds could stumble into concepts of a national God or a national religion. Perhaps adding the latter part because the National Socialist Party of Germany seemed to be forming its own form of Christianity in conflict with the views of the church. 
So, you know, this analysis of Hitler and religion, you know, he, he saw Christianity as indelibly Jewish in origin and character, uh, implying that the church was owned and controlled by Jews. And uh, he saw it as his personal responsibility to replace it. Uh, the, he said the political leader should not estimate the worth of a religion by taking some of its shortcomings into account. But he should ask himself whether there be any practical substitute in a view which is demonstrably better. Ultimately, such a substitute be available, only fools and criminals would think of abolishing existing religion. So he was clearly not a Christian, but because he regarded atheism as a state of mind, a state of the animal, uh, and also had a negative view towards Himmler and Rosenberg's proposals to him to create a national religion based on mystical notions, Hitler instead just decided to maintain his commitment towards Christianity for political convenience, only to later realize that his heinous ideas and acts turned the rest of the world strongly against his critical views of the church, as much as they illuminated the Christian deceptions that um, his ideas and statements were hoping to expose. So from this, his successors have realized that the, the best method of motivating people against an idea is by actually leading that idea, uh, influencing it, and ultimately invalidating it and killing it. Um, such as you know, by, uh, by guiding it down a line of thinking that is difficult to defend. Or, um, and this, this thought is you know, what some might call the art of the deal. Perhaps Hitler and his uh, uh, was sympathetic to national socialism and that it, uh, his advisors anticipated the backlash um, <clears throat> of his actions and, and therefore conspired to undercut the democratic socialism in Germany, which, uh, and, and if so, this would explain how, how Hitler was actually quoted to remark that Christianity was a prototype of Bolshevism, um, and which he believed preached the equality of all men amongst themselves and therefore violated the law of natural selection. So uh, there's different layers of potential conspir conspiring that could have been going on at this time. And um, it, it, many people don't want to think about a world where such, such of these layers exist, but uh, layers of deceptions occur, but um, it's, it's the world we live in. Humanity is capable of so much more and uh, more evil. And it, it starts with us committing to this tough truth uh, long before, you know, Hitler and Marx and Luther, you know, one group that was critical of the Catholic Church was the Mithraists, from whom Constantine claimed several stolen concepts as their own, as his own, including baptism and communion. Even the fact that John the Baptist was a cousin of Jesus um, was actually a concept that comes from the life of Mithra, whose first convert was his cousin, um, Medomena. Additionally, many houses of worship called Mithra have been found underneath Christian churches. So they literally put uh, replaced Mithraism with the Christianity in the same spots. Mithraism re-arose some in 651 CE when um, an alleged leader shared a copy of their holy book, the Ginzaraba, uh, proclaiming the chief prophet to be John the Baptist. Uh, Mithraism was suppressed further though with the Muslim conquest of Persia until it was revived after discovery of a quasi-historical mania document, the Haran Galaita, uh, which narrates the exodus from Palestine to Mesopotamia in the first century of a group called the Nasorians. And these Nasorians consider themselves not only the practitioners of Mandaism, but are now referred to as its priestly caste. Leaders of um, such Mandian schools, sometimes called Gnostic schools, uh, include teachers by the name of Basilides, Marchion, and Valentinus <clears throat> in the first couple of centuries. Like other Gnostics, uh, Basilides taught that salvation comes through knowledge and not through faith. The historian Origen complained that Basilides uh, deprived men of um, salutary fear by teaching that transmigrations are the only punishments after death, not hell. Another Gnostic teacher in France, Marchand, uh, argued that many of the teachings of Jesus were incompatible with the actions of Yahweh, uh, a belligerent God of the Hebrew Bible. Marchand's eraser is a phrase used to describe his rejection of the Hebrew God and all of the Old Testament, and acceptance only of the Gospel of Luke and the 10 Pauline epistles, uh, as he saw Paul as the only true apostle. 
For this reason, the Marcosian school faced even greater criticism than in other Gnostic schools more closely affiliated with Rome. Because the Manians were persecuted, they continued to suppress their knowledge and customs for the sake of safety. The Gospel of Thomas, for instance, directs the followers of Thomas, when you go into any region, eat what they serve you and heal the sick among them, which to me is an expression of the Manian practice to follow the customs of the lands they occupy while disavowing the sayings and rituals in one's heart. The Dead Sea Scrolls refer to a teacher of righteousness prior to the church, which seems to be a prototype of Jesus. The teacher was regarded as a redeemer or savior and put to death by reactionary factions. Critics of this teacher of righteousness ardently believe that God could forgive sins, which is why teacher 2.0 had to be considered the same as God. And, and this is why the church insisted with great ardor that the prophet Jesus was a miracle working son of God. Uh, one people that still operates um, by some of the Gnostic principles today are the Romani or Roma, who by their name must have been cast out of Rome at some point long ago. Though they are thought to have originated in India sometimes, given how their language reflects many Arabic and Persian words. Though they adopt the dominant religion of their host country, as Gnostics, uh, Gnosticism suggests them to do, uh, the Roma continue to practice Shaktism, wherein the metaphysical reality is considered inherently feminine, namely Adi Parashakti. The Roma and other Shaktis only worship a male deity if the worship is conducted through a female consort of that deity such as the Virgin Mary instead of Jesus. The Roma specifically venerate Saint Sarah, who was a servant to one of the three Marys and seen as a protectress of the Roma. They claim to have no specific records left by ancestors and their story is retold by clan family customs, such as singing and storytelling. While many among the Roma lack access to education and therefore fall short in some intellectual standards, uh, they are not quite the con steves and livers of luxury that our television shows would have you to think. It is said that were significant changes made within the Romani culture following World War II that more Roma embraced evangelism at this time, particularly in France and Spain, and, were, uh, and that there were over a thousand Romani churches. More and more documents debunking the claims of the church have been brought to greater light. Sibylline oracles, for instance, warn of false testaments. And, um, and then an old false writer shall appear in that time again, counterfeiting his country. Being also blind, he shall have much wit and eloquence, but a small measure of reason. So, you know, same writings, uh, Gnostic writings reflect um, several ideas floating around at the time that have to do with the role of women. Like, oh, Italy, you will not be a mother of the good, but a nurse of wild beasts. And, oh, Isis, the unfortunate goddess, you shall continue at the waters of the Nile alone, mad and raging upon the sands of Acheron, which was a place of death. And uh, you shall no more be remembered through all the earth. These Sibylline oracles also hint that it's up to mothers to teach their boys to uphold the rights of women generation after generation, prophesizing that when the tribes of women do not produce children who conquer, some deceivers will arise with a great fame and prophets. Uh, Buddhism uh, is another uh, example. Uh, it's, not it's not exactly heretical of the church, possibly because its teachings frown upon being critical of others, but it is arguably a competitor. The general teachings of the Buddha are great, specifically the idea of dukkha or attachment to desires, which is a cause of all suffering in Buddhism. Um, also, also useful is Buddhism's teaching of how to combat the five hindrances, uh, lust, ill will, lethargy, worry, hopelessness, and how to practice five great precepts. One, not to destroy life, or at least always honor it. Two, not to steal. Three, not to combat, commit adultery. Four, not to lie. And five, not to intoxicate oneself. However, I found it concerning that Buddhists believe humanity is supreme in the universe, which uh, we know the truth is that humans are fallible with many mistakes, moments in, the, uh, in our lives, uh, sometimes with tragic results. Uh, another concern is that Buddhism teaches that enlightenment comes suddenly instead of from continual commitment to uh, logic and knowledge. Uh, 
also Buddhism suggests that uh, all of us are um, capable of, uh, though Buddhism suggests that all of us are capable of uh, achieving enlightenment, um, we, uh, we know that um, it's still, uh, by, by its belief in the Buddha, still is pushing this uh, idea of a male leader and misogyny involved in that. <clears throat> um, the Buddha himself was actually firmly against uh, worship and uh, refusing to name a replacement. Uh, as the saying goes, religion is following a messenger, spirituality is following a message. But um, the never ending existence of groups that were skeptical of the church is perhaps why the church in the King James Version um, of the New Testament removed the phrase, the just will sprout like the phoenix uh, or die and be reborn and re replaced it with the righteous shall flourish like a palm tree, he shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Now, what they did is they, they, had, they thereby removed the original intent that hinted that social justice warriors sprouted up all the time. Uh, seeking to bury any acknowledgement in the Bible that conditions were not um, conditions proposed by the church were were not suitable for justice in the first place. Uh, with the dawn of the information age and um, you know, evidence of religious deception being more publicly available, the religious forces have realized that they are really on their last threads of the of the rope holding up the you know the drawbridge that protects their castle of lies. Mystical concepts are found in nearly every major religion. Buddhism has several concepts for it, um, including bodhi, which means awakened, kensho, which means seeing nature, and satori, which means understanding. Perhaps the original term for mysticism was esotericos, which uh, means belonging to an inner circle. The esotericos or uh, were used to refer, refer to the illusion mysteries until the church fathers downplayed their importance with uh with commoners they uh the ancient esoteric mysteries included alchemy or modern day chemistry of metals medicines and other materials uh astrology modern day astronomy with an emphasis on interpretations and impacts on human affairs of the stars and magic use of symbols and ceremony to interpret and influence the behavior of oneself and others <clears throat> Today, we focus on the pseudoscience of the early investigators of alchemy, astrology, and magic, whereas I believe we do not give enough credit to, to these individuals who were pioneers of the exoteric along with the esoteric, um, deriving evidence-based conclusions from data and reason in order to resolve individual life problems and even answer the big questions like the meaning of existence. They employed science, and when science fell short, they employed logic. They pursued theories beyond the world of appearances, especially into the realm of intuition and emotion, which still escape investigation by current instruments and technology today. Interestingly, it was an all-female tribe of Amazons who are thought to have created the original encyclopedia of medicines and techniques to reduce suffering. Uh, reducing suffering is the stated goal of Buddhism. Buddhism, though, suggests that enlightenment comes suddenly with knowledge uh, as if there is just some awakening piece of knowledge, perhaps anada, um, that produces some moral, mental, or physiological transformation in a person. Uh, another Eastern religion, Taoism, implies that it's more of a continual commitment to logic and, and knowledge. Um, thought to have originated in the Chinese religious tradition, uh, Tao denotes something that is both the source of and the force behind everything that exists. So meaning the way, the path or principle Tao is said to become clear when one achieves mental stillness associated with harmony with all thoughts. Taoism values knowledge, enlightenment, salvation, emancipation, or oneness with God and upholds that any one of us can reach this wisdom by practicing philanthropy to the point of personal poverty and along with abstinence from sex. So this form of mysticism has the overall goal of achieving human transformation, not just of experiencing mystical or visionary states of pleasure. Um, and similarly in Hinduism, individuals are encouraged to focus on spirit through yoga, a set of physical, mental, and spiritual practices applied towards the goal of moksha, meaning liberation, and perhaps even eternal omnipotence. 
Yoga requires focus on controlled breathing and asanas or specific postures designed to enhance core strength and concentration towards uh, achieving a theoretical harmony in right thought and right action. In some ways, uh, similar to Taoism, Hermeticism suggested that we can all ascend to God status and depart our physical realm through mental illness. As the book of uh, uh, Poimandres in uh, the Corpus Hermeticum asserts, whoever recognized himself as immortal uh, attained that good which is supreme. While whoever was led astray by desire, by love for the body, will wander in the darkness of the world of senses and suffer death. When I read this, I see the figurative language that was later interpreted literally by the Christian church to refer to hell and purgatory. Nonetheless, the followers of Hermes did believe God was a source of all beings and all light, and uh, we can all return to that light. This metaphysics is still quite a leap for us today, yet we do follow Hermes in, some, in many ways, uh, as he contributed greatly to our understanding of geometry, electricity, magnetism, materials, and physical sciences. Mysticism expanded uh, from these Eastern religions into Jewish spirituality as well. Uh, Judaism clarified its mystic views in a set of scripts known as the Kabbalah, which associates the moral, <clears throat> uh, mortal and finite universe created by Yahweh with the mysterious Ein Sof, infinity. There are plenty of signs in Christianity too, with the damned in hell and repentant in purgatory and the blessed in paradise. We also hear from Christians that the all-powerful and all-merciful Father Deity sends angels to watch over his elect, Mark 13, 27. Christianity assumes a belief that humans are not self-motivating and uses fear of an all-knowing higher power, along with a fictitious hell, to deter us from committing crimes with the aim of maintaining social order among the believers. Islam also uh, incorporates even more of a mystic, um, of the mystical in its explanations of the Israelite Prince Solomon being wooed by Queen Sheba and the workings of a genie, whereas Judaism rep, uh, presents Solomon as a remarkably wealthy but otherwise ordinary figure of history. Some accounts in Islam add to Solomon's story, suggesting he's uh, greater even than the genies uh, and able to you know, uh, create, um, uh, do, do lots of other um, mystical activities. Uh, several centuries later, the already mystical principles of Islam were expanded upon by people called the Druze, who emphasized the teachings of the 11th century Fatimid caliphs, adding to it a belief in a cycle of reincarnations that ultimately ends with the soul reuniting with what they call the cosmic mind. They may have been influenced by the teachings of Guanyin, uh, meaning one who perceives the sounds of the world, who was a bodhisattva sir, uh, or um, spiritual leader circa uh, 1025 CE. Uh, it was known as the goddess of mercy for her focus on compassion. A century later, a similar mystical tradition called Sufism arose, maintaining the teachings of Sunni Islam, similar as the Shia teachings were the basis of Druze. These two newer mystic traditions uh, were probably inspired by traveling troubadours known to spread spirituality through song. So Taoism, Hermeticism, and these similar ancient religions, mystical religions, constitute what we now call Gnosticism, a general embrace of a spiritual world and shun of the physical universe as artificial. Gnosticism focuses on the ultimate questions like, why do the wicked prosper? Why do the good suffer? What is at the end of life? Is this all there is? One general tenet of the Gnostics was to avoid the urge to believe in a fatherly God figure who created and governs the world. To them, the creator was a malevolent at best and, uh, or at best incompetent. Uh, Gnostics study all sorts of ancient texts like the Vedas and the Bibles. and uh, They look for hidden meanings and symbolism contained within them in order to better understand our artificial universe. The Gnostics generally taught that human value did not lie in some superhuman essence, but via knowledge, specifically knowledge that raises us to living in harmony within our world. The gospel of truth in the Gnostic Bible explains the, the fruit of knowledge is a discovery, bringing joy. It signifies that one finds God in oneself 
that the fog of air and terror is gone and that the nightmare of darkness is exchanged for an eternal heavenly day. Therein is stated the essence of Gnosis, the, the word of knowledge redeems rather than kills. Another Gnostic tenet is uh, syzygy, which uh, is an integration of the masculine and feminine, uh, whereby females and males are held as having equal worth and equal rights and ascension by any human requires appreciation of, for both. Gnostic Bible demonstrates this by referring to Eve as hero of the light and Promethean liberator from God's tyrannical authority, evidenced by her inclination towards knowledge, uh, knowledge of the, um, the uh, tree of life specifically. In the 1700s, Rosicrucians renewed efforts to reveal information about the mysteries, proving insight into not just the physical universe, but the spiritual. Though we here too have found no proof, many humans have spent quite a bit of effort investigating the incredible mental abilities humankind has thought to be able to possess, um, such as channeling, telepathy, telekinesis, and, and even astral projection into normally imperceptible dimensions. We must remember to be careful that careful of the knowledge that we blindly embrace or, or else we work against ourselves in our effort to achieve harmony in thoughts and actions. So new forms of mysticism uh, have popped up in the last century, uh, beginning in the early 1900s with the Theosophical Society of New York City, which is now in cities across the globe, uh, at, which emphasizes three objectives, to form a nucleus of the universal brotherhood of humanity without distinction of gender, race, caste, or creed, to encourage the study of comparative religion, philosophy, and science, and three, to investigate the unexplained laws of nature and powers latent in humans. Uh, up until the 1950s, there was also a growing form of mysticism called the fourth way, which attempted to align the competing ways of the fakir, of the Sufi tradition, the yogi from Hindu and Sikh traditions, and the monk from Buddhist traditions with Tantra to teach people how to improve their attention. Its downfall perhaps was that it created a cult-like hierarchy with the founder atop. In the 1950s, Scientology began to grow and is now a $2 billion religion that believes souls reincarnate and have even lived on other planets before Earth. In the 1960s, during a time of the second wave feminist movement, Wicca defiantly championed the practices of witchcraft. And then in the 1970s, the goddess, goddess worship um, movement grew as a kind of a neo pagan movement, predominantly in North America, Western Europe, Australia, and New Zealand, in reaction to perceptions of you know, predominant organized religion being male dominated. In reaction, uh, it has a proclivity towards being female dominated and male dominating. Uh, one of the challenges that we face is in reconciling belief system is how do we create a culture where both men and women are welcomed and integrated in a way that both the feminine and the masculine aspects of humanity are valued. From my experiences and study, such a, such a um, worldview or religion hasn't really existed since uh, early Egypt. Wicca and witchcraft are often associated with magic, but it's not at all the, the only form of spirituality that plays with the supernatural. As we've discussed, Christianity claims miracles, promises eternal life, and created the horridness of hell to influence human behavior for its own betterment. In Islam, Solomon is said to have gained powers by defeating other deities, like the ability to employ birds, control wind, crush ants and enslave demons. The, the concepts of these kinds of magical prophets resonate with us so strongly because they're pleasant. It, it says something about the nature of humanity that we go with what is pleasant over what is an inconvenient truth. Sometimes psychology refers to this as toxic positivity. Uh, this is just an example of how we can be calmed by you know, the so-called snake oil spirituality that has no basis in science. Concepts that happen to be calming, healing, or motivating have a reason, uh, but it might not be supported by reason. So we must be aware that collective belief systems of our ancestors, um, you know, they, that our ancestors might have been fooled into continuing these falsehoods and uh, you know, motivate, is motivation for, uh, for having, uh, for them to be fighting in other people's wars. 
uh, false hope and blind faith are fatal, whether we wish to believe it or not. The desire to gain money is another form of magical psychology and how a commitment to working hard leads to financial success, even if that success comes more to um, those having financial privilege than it does to others, uh, creating injustice. In modern times, this phenomenon of money is called the law of attraction, um, but it was described long ago, actually, in Matthew 25, 29. For to, who, for, um, for to everyone who has will be given more, and he will have abundance, but from him who has not, even what he has will be taken away. This idea of law of attraction is, is oddly appealing to us, though, um, uh, because it, it plays with our desire to believe that we live in a merit-based economy and control our own financial destiny. Um, which means we conveniently choose to see it as truth and a relative truth uh, without ensuring that it's a, an absolute truth. Defenders though, of the, the law of attraction and toxic positivity fail to realize that no one is actually arguing that it's not important to have encouraging people around us who spread emotional safety and uplift us. In fact, it can be essential to simply get through the day um, yet out of fear of not being liked, we learn to put forth these false good vibes when we actually feel cruddy. The phoniness is actually stunning. And once we start to notice it, we start to notice it everywhere, especially on television. Consumers of television seeking these feel good feelings spend more of their time watching unrealistic shows full of actors trained to be really good at perpetuating falsehoods about the human experience. As we become more aware of this phoniness, uh, entertainment has actually shifted to keep us dumb and happy, making us believe reality TV uh, are people just like us when actually these shows are structured and scripted in advance and draw from a pool of aspiring actors. Once we start to see the damage the entertainment industry is doing to our society, we realize that such false positivity is dark magic, not the lovely light work that we want to believe it is even if the intent of the entertainment is to delight and not actually to beguile. And this is why it's important to surround ourselves with other people who are reliable and encouraging us towards truth and authenticity. And it's why we must be aware what signs we choose to receive from the universe too, about how to act and what to think. We must be careful not to invite these devils into our homes uh, or soon we'll be accustomed to their artificial light and not be able to see the natural light of truth, even when it's right in front of us. An even greater offense of the law of attraction is that the logical next step to it, its logic that bad circumstances should be met with more bad circumstances is uh, believing that humanity's role is to bring about those bad circumstances. So I do not, nor does anyone have the authority to deliver karmic punishment yet humans do wrongly. And there are those in this world who actually aim to beguile intentionally using the, you know, the classical concepts of dark magic, like vexes, spooks, and serpent work, as well as just uh, the simple uh, threat to terrorize and uh, manipulate the behavior of others. So our, our adversaries for the, of their country attempt to incite discord within our society using these concepts by instigating disharmony in our individual thoughts on a collective scale. One method countries like Russia are very good at is flooding our news feeds and entertainment industry with harmful pseudoscience using scientific words like vibration. Then these memes get picked up unwittingly by citizens who spread them, uh, often you know, with purely good intentions. Colorful, colorful crystals, oils, and incantations are lovely, yet my experience on this planet has convinced me that the true magic of living is recognizing that the power that these tools have and then manifesting or womanifesting those gains without them. Using only a visualization or imagination of the sensation of that delight. And this way we are uh, more resilient and resistant to our adversaries' efforts to at instigating disharmony. The harm of toxic positivity compounds when it's our leaders telling us to fear when there is no reason to, uh, or when they tell us there is no reason to uh, be angry when there is. 
Both are dark magic, not because of the intention, but because of the method. Good intention can still be dark magic, even if it involves falsehood and has the effect of disrupting a person's ability to reason or trust. And that is why magic is the art of knowing when to spread good vibes and when it is right to lean into discomfort. Basically, there are three ways to interpret any situation. Better than it actually is, worse than it actually is, or fairly accurate about how good or bad the situation is. Those who see the situation as better are creating a heaven for themselves, while those who see a situation as worse are creating a hell for themselves. But both heaven and hell as mental realms are actually products of a psychological effect called negativity bias, because the heaven makers are driven to avoid the truth of the situation due to their dread about the state of that world. So positivity bias is, does not really exist. I've talked with faith leaders of many types, and I feel the, the struggles faced by them and other social workers and emergency responders and people who deplete their own emotional energy to promote wellness in others, um, even when their emotional tanks are on fumes. And I see that so many of these types of helpers are, are so good at what they do because they have spent a lot of time sitting with the pain of so many others and spent much time in pain of their own. Their magic is they have stories of suffering that they can recall at any time and share with another who needs to hear it or learn from it. However, the knowledge of the world full of suffering is a heavy burden to bear. Um, we need people, we need all people really with, to, to find strength to sit with stories of struggle, to bear the pain of those stories, to advise others and to, to help us all learn how to prevent adversity, how to get through it and how to live with gratitude. It's, it was exactly my faith in humanity that guided me in making choices that I believe were best for humanity, trusting that this approach would be also be best for me. While logic suggests that our good actions in this life pay off and if an afterlife exists, reason tells me that our actions here have no effect on any next life. You know, reason, but, but also Buddha, uh, tells us that after the soul departs our bodies, we return to a cosmic oneness, like a cup of water scooped from the ocean and then dumped back into the waves again. As the Italian proverb states at the end of the game, the king and the pawn go into the same box. This occurs no matter our past thought, uh, thoughts or actions. And if we're going to be on this planet, though, we ought to prefer the lovely you know, liberty of acceptance and over condemnation and imprisonment by our peers and therefore we ought to do things because they're the right things to do and that's what we're all are to one another peers so all full of imperfections and still deserving of forgiveness you know without getting into the calculus of the multiverse or uh you know our knowledge of mathematics suggests that there are an infinite number of universes which exist based on the number of choices any of us have and the frequency with which we've made those choices and our different universes. Uh, this, this math and logic suggest we are, we're actually all the same being, living temporary small existences as separate individuals. So when we commit crimes against others, we're actually committing them against ourselves. Uh, a human, human will exist in this system, but the, the effect of it is barely noticeable from the perspective of one individual, but in the collective cooperation of not even whole species, but whole universes over a period of time longer than an eon or anything we have any concept of. The simple truth about spirituality is that if there is a higher power, which I actually believe there is, uh, it's likely to be so far beyond our comprehension and far from the assumptions humankind has made of it over time. Dubious, therefore, is the idea that the higher power has any physical form whatsoever, let alone has a special specific gender. Uh, it's doubtful that we can even have a conversation with it. So beware of those prophets that suggest that they have done so. The, the thing that I realized early, you know, as a, as a kid who was um, as an agnostic is that even if one doubts the existence of, of any kind of higher power, logic gives us a convincing case for living for good and not for evil. A higher power would not be very loving and merciful and therefore not much of a higher power if it were to judge beings for their imperfections and therefore would not be really worthy of worship anyhow. 
Therefore, a religion that tries to make you think you're damned unless you believe something or unless you practice something strictly misses the idea of love entirely. In reason, and therefore in truth, we, we don't need the mystic stuff to do what's right. We just need to see how equality enables us to live well among our tribe and with other tribes. Then we realize the world is a better place for humanity when we make it so. And, and though the integrity of our conviction, uh, through the integrity of our convictions and deeds and the degree to which um, the legacy we leave encourages others to do good, uh, is this transformation we're undergoing is about transcending our current status as, as human animals and behaving in, for the betterment of ourselves and elevating our species to behave for the betterment of our world. It's not actually a literal transformation from a material world to some heaven or astral plane or planet, but a cognitive shift away from a selfish state that creates additional suffering to a pluralistic one that, whereby we serve the globe like gods and goddesses. It's, it's critical that we understand this inconvenient truth and start embracing the faith in ourselves and in each other and the truth that any one of us may become godly. So my challenge for you is to consider a more truthful, albeit more tragic set of beliefs about spirituality and, or seemingly tragic, um, but actually hopeful. And, and even to try to prove me wrong. So where, I, where I'm correct though, have the courage to be honest with yourself and forgive yourself. Uh, you're not to blame for the lies that you've held. All of your life, your parents, your pastors, your community leaders, we're all reinforcing these ideas in you and in each other. And your parents aren't to blame for the lies either because they heard them from their parents and so on. Generation after generation, our ancestors were doing their best and sharing what they saw as a beautiful existence with those that they loved. The blame goes back not just hundreds, but thousands of years. We do, however, become burdened with blame going forward if we choose to perpetuate the lies for future generations. We are allowed to be stuck in our ways, but let's not let our children become stuck in theirs. Teach them to use their brains. Teach them if they're going to worship anything, worship logic, reason, science, liberty, justice, and equity, even above their families, even above their own happiness. The survival of our species and other species and our planet depends on it. So to aid us in our, in our journey, I've outlined four essential principles to what I call truth-serving spirituality. First, with the principle of religious freedom, our government must do more than talk about religious tolerance as a core value and walk the walk. By finally eliminating the tax exemption for religious organizations and removing the religious symbolism from our currency. Second, with the principle of racial equality, our government must finally identify re religious bloodlines for what they are, a form of bigotry and caste. Third, with the principle of gender equality, our government must finally label monotheistic religions for what they are, sexist oppressors and violators of human rights of women as are the governments who support them, which includes the United States. And fourth, with the principle of social responsibility, our government must make religious institutions accountable against sexual abuse, genocide, and human trafficking, and make amends for past wrongs, including admitting ro these religious roles in slave trade, sex trade, drug trade, and illicit transnational crime. Clearly, and fortunately, this is going to result in diminishment or even elimination of major world religions, including Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. I said it was essential, not easy. I expect most faith facilities will be repurposed by localities or become private residences or businesses, while spiritual study uh, in careful accordance with interfaith principles will shift to actually schools, libraries, and community centers. If you prescribe to these bad religions, don't. If you're Christian, you can try studying the teachings of the many Buddhas that have existed over time instead of the life of the one named Jesus. If you are Jewish or Muslim, you may find Sufism or Druze as it's uh, many as one principle, a peaceful alternative that honors your people and your culture. Even if these religions are not perfect, they at least teach and practice nonviolence when others haven't. I do cautiously endorse Baha'i and Unitarian Universalist as two faiths that might be acceptable for interfaith learning um, due to their past experience reconciling the subscribed structures, symbolism, and ceremonies of different faiths. 
these two though ought to be phased out through tax incentives, but during the, the difficult transition that, that we're about to make, it would be wise to accept the aesthetic power of some faith facilities as a critical component of spiritual maintenance and healing that leverages the psychological forces of ceremony and beauty that we, we love about our religions. It's imperative that we use the religious tax incentives only for faith facilities that certify and submit to interfaith inspection. Interfaith is still rejected by many faith leaders who see it as a Western tool um, that disempowers enemies of the Christianity, which may be true. And this is why I call on the country to be an example, not an exception, and halt all the ways that we cater to Christian influences. Honestly, though, I'm not asking you to believe in any God, but to believe in yourself. There's, there's no one to heal or baptize as John or Jesus did, but with a little help, you can heal yourself. Seek forgiveness from another. Do the work of showing love to sinners and atoning for your own sins. Trust your fellow human and work with them to figure out how what their view of what's best doesn't match your view of what's best. Because everyone is wrong sometimes, and those who are wrong all the time have just a hard time admitting it, as those who are wrong only once in a while. Uh, part of our task in transitioning from multi-faith to interfaith will be to focus on collective grace, which can be done by remembering the belief that humanity had fallen from a state of divine grace to a state of sin and suffering. And remember redemption, that the higher power is accepting of all beings in it, and we should all should be forgiving of one another and ourselves as well. We really are alike in how we all suffer. And uh, as I've mentioned, government has an important role here. So here are the governance requirements if our society is to be truly self-serving. First, we must ensure government maintains spiritual maintenance as a function essential to mental health uh, of citizens. Continued in its you know, common form of uh, group spirituality services uh, in a weekly basis. Second, uh, government must, must maintain the availability of faith leaders for more focused spiritual healing in the form of individual and small group spiritual counseling, something like confessionals or marital consultations. Third, uh, government must maintain spiritual education, which comes in the form of the study of interfaith dialogue and other comparative religion analysis, such as that facilitated by the International Federation for Interfaith and the Intercultural Dialogue. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, by the International Federation for Interfaith and Intercultural Dialogue and by the International Interfaith Center. Such, an interna uh, such international religious bodies are suited to provide credentialing of faith leaders uh, and, and faith organizations, uh, oversight of interreligious resources and inspection of religious nonprofits, educational initiatives and community initiatives. Fourth, we must maintain the legislative and federal advocacy for spirituality, um, such as that done by the Interfaith Alliance in Washington, D.C., which is suited to ensure effective federal regulation, funding incentives, certification, and inspection of faith facilities, state systems for data collection and oversight of interfaith activity, and local guides for how communities can embrace interfaith principles, coordinate interfaith work, and steer faith facilities through transitions. And fifth, we must uh, not only maintain, but expand the spirit of service that arises from human services functions that are often provided by um, uh, our locally based community organizations, and as well as the Peace Corps, AmeriCorps, Citizen Corps. Grassroots community organizing at, at the neighborhood level provides the needed link between civic responsibility and government accountability, uh, which often occurs via the faith facilities in the community. Creating an alternative structure will help communities transition away from the faith traditions for uh, the, and the essential elements provided by those faith-based uh, organizations that we need. In short, it helps to toss out rights R-I-T-E-S, and focus on rights, R-I-G-H-T-S. As we debunk invalid belief systems, we must do so with careful compassion to the peoples and the cultures who have been comforted and encouraged by religions through the millennia. We must realize that rituals are a large part of a person's cultural identity. 
in solidarity, we might even retain in collective celebration some of the religious rituals of, of many of our belief systems, as they might very well have a message behind them that is still relevant and valuable. The transformation required to bring about world peace requires that the world unite around human values, uh, human rights, and untie ourselves from the mindset of religious rights. It's going to require a lot of individual change as people peel themselves from belief systems that are detrimental to our progress. And leaders are gonna to have to actually walk within their values and not just talk about doing so. Instead of telling us what we wanna hear, our political leaders must find the political courage to actually lead us along a difficult path to justice and to peace. In closing, please be sure to do your self-care tonight um, because of the profound introspection, maybe even healing that, uh, that we did together uh, in this talk. That means make sure you do at least one thing today that brings you joy and make sure you set aside the time to meditate on the achievements and delights of your day today. I thank you for the honor of joining me in this, in this uh, sacred discussion. If you found this interesting and want to hear more, subscribe to my newsletter, follow me on Facebook and IG at Who is Mark Denome, and find my books for sale on Amazon and Kindle. If you so desire, you can hire me to work with your organization uh, through my website, whoismarkdenome.com, or by emailing whoismarkdenome at gmail.com. Feel free to continue, uh, contribute to my efforts via patreon.com slash whoismarkdenome. Every moment of every day, we are leaving an impression of ourselves on this earth and on each other. A better world is possible, and I'm asking you to help create it.